with, with regards to, you know, what is hockey sense, the idea is, you know, it's commonly described as, as, you know, players that appear to have good anticipation of what's to happen on the ice. They seem to react sooner than other players. Terms like seeing the ice, great anticipation are often things that you'll hear in terms of, of the way these players are described. Um, and, and for a long time, it's been assumed that these players have a gift. Now, there's certainly no arguing that certain people have certain aptitudes for, for different things. I think that research shows us that, that certainly, you know, I, I might be more mathematically inclined than someone else, or someone else might be more engineering inclined than someone else. And, and that's certainly true. And there's a lot that goes into that, you know, be it intelligence, be it uh, interest level. And, and what you and what have you the, the big thing here and when you start to research performance and one of the things from the, the private perspective that I've become is a, a performance coach and so you know when you're constantly trying to find ways that how can we impact someone's performance in an area and you start to head down that path in terms of research um, you start to uncover things um, that, that really understand the idea that experts are made they're not born and so it's 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 easy to say that well you know the greats are born with it well the greats there's greats in every industry but that's not to say that things can't be developed and so when we look at different studies there's one here from 2007 in harvard business review what we found is is anders erickson had demonstrated that experts are made and not born so specifically with regard to hockey he demonstrated that the qualities that would make up hockey sense can be learned. And so when, when you start to really dig into peer reviewed studies and different things in terms of how learning occurs um, with respect to sense, with respect to anticipation, you know, there's a lot of the elements that can be learned, but there's a process that goes into that. And it can often be daunting, specifically in a hockey setting where there's so many different things that are going on. There's wins, there's losses, there's positions, there's management. There's, you know, at the minor hockey level, there's parents. At the pro level, there's all kinds of different constraints that come in to, that draw away, and it can be certainly a daunting task. And so one of the things that I want to try to do for you is simplify the way that we can look at it and give you some strategies and some tools um, that allow you to sort of demystify it a little bit, if you will. And so, you know, from a coaching standpoint, um, as a team coach, it can often be a challenge because you've got the minor level 15 or 17 players to consider. Um, interest level is different. And of course, natural talent level for, for something is, is different among players. So, you know, to start with, to teach it, we need to understand what needs to be learned and how to best teach it. And examining, you know, aspects of hockey sense and then breaking it down into teachable components. Um, so that players can learn this mystical concept of sense. So players with hockey sense are, are typically those that possess individual skill that allow them to do some things. And what I want to do here is I'm going to try to, you know, when we're done this, is give us the link and the importance of how the technical skill backs up the tactical processing that makes up hockey sense, meaning um, a lot of times, you know, to be able to read something um, and then execute what you've read uh, in terms of a play becomes, you know, very, very linked and important. Uh, so oftentimes, you know, you'll see a player that has sense that they've also got superior individual skill in many cases. Um, you know, they can impress people with their quick sticks and their, their overall ability, but they always seem to be in the right place. And so one of the questions that we ask or why are these players able to see the game at a level above the rest? Or, you know, do they really have more hockey sense than another player? And typically when you inspect it and really peel it back, it becomes apparent these players have spent more time on ice and unstructured situations where they're free to learn by doing and experience what works and what doesn't. Now, you know, I, I'm not going to beat the, the small area drum um, because I know that as hockey people, specifically, you know, folks that are taking the time to go through a presentation like this, we all understand the merits of small area 
And maybe for different reasons, we understand it to be valuable in different ways, meaning, you know, some of us may say, well, you know, it's because we now have to make plays under time and space constrictions. There's a lot of different things that go into it. It challenges your skill to be able to execute because of lack of time and space. But really what starts to happen is subconsciously players start to have to seek um, scenarios. They need to get into scenarios, but they need to seek problem resolution. They need to, to solve problems. And, and so the unstructured nature of it, and where I go with that is, you know, especially at young ages, unstructured means consequence free. The consequence is, is that they're going to recognize this worked or it didn't. Um, and, and we'll get into that a little bit greater here. Um, so I want to put the link together here between um, how players can develop their hockey sense. So there's a couple of things. The, the understanding that the skill level, the technical skill level, and the tactical execution using said skills, the interconnection between the two. So obviously, you know, players raise their skill level via skating or skill session. Um, I'll talk a lot about habit-based development. And so a habit might include, you know, stopping on pucks or going to the net and stopping or coming back to open ice to support a puck. But really the concept here is this is the technical portion that allows a player to build comfort level in the tactical setting. I like to talk a lot about high percentage versus low percentage. So, um, you know, how often have we had a player, have you had a player who's got great skating ability, you know, they look great in drills, they'll go to a skill session and they're very adept at doing, you know, skill practices per se, but they never really have any understanding of why they're doing what they're doing. And, and you'll often, anybody that's spent any time with me will hear me talk a lot about the idea of does what you do, do you use skill to solve problems or to create problems? And so anybody that, that's, that's coaching kids, you know, you'll see little Johnny or little Jill tearing down the ice and they've got great speed and they've got wonderful hands and they can really shoot a puck, but they put themselves in situations that not allow the, the, the frequency of success doesn't work because they're, you know, not really understanding how they're using those things. And so when we link this to, you know, unstructured situations, consequence free, some of the areas where players can figure out how do I use the skill that I possess to solve the problem, which the problem typically is how do I access the area or the spot on the ice to do the things I want to do? Um, how do I make the play to the open person? How do I score the goal by getting to the spot I know I need to get to in order to feel comfortable to score? And so some of those ways outdoor hockey free play those are all chances to solve problems and so specifically you know in developmental ages at young ages and, and i think we can say that anything below the national hockey league is a development you know the american league ontario hockey league triple a double a a b you name it you know i think if we looked at the idea that anything below the national hockey league is a development league and so you know, really what we want to do is, is have the opportunity to make mistakes, to opportunity to learn from others what worked, what didn't work. But specifically at young ages, it's about linking understanding with skill. So, you know, oftentimes when you think of a, a player that you would say has great hockey sense, and if, you know, you all would be able to close your eyes and think of a player that you coached or your own son or daughter, player that you 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 like to watch on tv um how often do you find someone with superior hockey sense that doesn't have an accomplished level of skill to support that and so i think you, what you find is is typically the sense is certainly aided by the structural foundation of good skill so how can we teach hockey sense you know and if if we relate this to minor hockey with limitations in our our, our minor hockey system um, you know, obviously coaches are limited to the structure of a hockey season and, and, you know, limited practice hours and availability of help or resources can become a thing. Um, certainly, you know, to put someone in any kind of position, whether it's structured or unstructured, um, skill-based or not, you need the opportunity to do so. And I think we can all recognize that there's 
of challenges at times during the structure of a hockey season to fit it all in. Um, you know, in, in, in doing different clinics over the years, specifically from the HEO or the Hockey Canada perspective, um, where you get an opportunity to talk to coaches at various levels, um, one of the things, you know, that, that coaches will say is, you know, there's just so much to do, there's so much to cover from a skills perspective, from, you know, as they get older, from, from implementing a system. Uh, I recognize that, you know, sometimes in minor hockey, winning can be a dirty word, but everybody, you know, when they keep score, people want to be successful and, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it can be daunting. It can be daunting within the, the limitations of the structure that's provided at the level that you're coaching at or that you're uh, participating. In. So often, you know, I, there's really no, and we can talk about this later, there's really no substitute at, at any point or any point in time where skill isn't going to be a necessity to be able to aid in the processing. So. Again, linking the technical aspect of skill with the tactical aspect of sense and how it applies and where it applies and those things, um, we need to ensure that a player's skill level allows them, A, the confidence, B, the aptitude to be able to, for instance, maintain control of a puck long enough to make a read as to where I should go with it next. I think it goes without saying skating, puck handling, passing, shooting, all those things are our main skills. And we recognize that small area games, they can start to help develop recognition on which skills are used uh, under pressure. Skill development through repetition at practice is essential for players to be successful. So, you know, going back to making sure it's not as though it's not like software where we can upload the latest update and all of a sudden the player can handle a puck well. Um, can they technically handle it stationary? Can they start to add movement? Can they start to add speed? Can they then do it under pressure? And so there's a you know understanding the steps along the way to make sure that each time a player grows, they go from a 12 year old to a 13 year old and puberty starts to happen and they've grown. And so they're starting to learn motor patterns again about how their body works. All of those things can be deterrents when it comes to applying sense in that, um, trying to refigure out how my body works with context of how do I handle the puck or I feel comfortable in my own skin. And so making sure we understand that um, players need to solve problems with their skill and not memorize moves or skills without context. So really what we talk about in terms of, you know, going back to the previous slide, automating um, habits, making sure that we start to link the ability that, okay, I've, I've got the puck skill to freeze a defender with a shoulder fake. It's something that I can use when I'm attacking in this scenario. So recognizing that I need the tools in the toolbox in order to allow the read that I make to happen. And so, you know, one of the things that I'll do and a lot of the consulting work that I would, for instance, do with a a pro is is you would break down shifts of their game and you know to to do anything without figuring out from an evidence based standpoint what a player does whether it's a pro or a, a, a younger player um, is it's like hunting in the dark it just it doesn't work so it's important that we recognize the habits that you want to put in place are ones that if I make a read that this is how I'm going to protect a puck for instance. I need to have the requisite skill to be able to support the read that I've made. From a tactical IQ standpoint or intelligence standpoint, uh, it's enhanced with a strong foundation of technical skill. So oftentimes, you know, for instance, you know, while well, this player gets a puck in the offensive zone and they seem to give it up all the time. Well, the first thing that, you know, potentially we would look at is, are they giving it up because they're scared? Are they giving it up because they don't know? Are they giving it up because from a technical skill perspective, they don't understand establishing body position? Or is there something missing in the movement chain of skills that prevent them from executing? So maybe they've got poor edging. Um, maybe they don't have an activated stance. Maybe they expose pucks in bad areas. So understanding that IQ and skill can be linked because the skill gives them the confidence to be able to freely make reads. Um, 
and, and execute what's going through their mind. So ways that this can be achieved from, from a player standpoint or a coaching standpoint at the, at the hockey level in terms of team setting, um, engage coaching, being active during practice, but not active in terms of telling people what to do, um, helping them and giving them strategies and asking them to figure things out, to make mistakes are part of learning, but giving them tactical understanding, but allowing them to solve the problems themselves. So one example of that is, um, you know, problems occur in, in every game, but when you start to break the game of hockey down, you recognize that it's the same recurring problems, typically, game over game. Um, I, you know, using one example, there's a loose puck recovery. I get to the puck. Well, how do I buy myself more time in order to find the next play? And so some of the things that, you know, as coaches, we want to help so badly that we overcoach at times. So we want to make sure that people have strategies that they recognize, um, you know, here's how I link, here's the skills that are going to be involved, but what skills are going to solve what problems so that I can tactically do the things that I'm trying to do. As a coach, we need to know those fundamentals. I think, again, that goes without saying. Um, ensure that players understand the primary objective of drills and so i think as as coaches we grow uh, and we recognize that it's really important that we include players uh, in in the understanding of why we're doing what we're doing we live in an era and, and athletes have developed to the point where if they're part of the journey they're going to become much more engaged and so making sure they understand what this drill is, why we're doing this drill, and what its relationship to the game is, is all ways that it starts to apply a data set for those players to refer back to when they find themselves in the recurring situations of the game. Uh, again, creating pathways between drills and gameplay. So, you know, without going too far off topic, I mean, this could be a, a, a presentation all its own. It's really important that the things that we do in drilling have a pathway that can be created from the player in his mind, her mind, from the, the game and the practice and the practice in the game. There's got to be that translatability. And if there isn't, we've got to figure out where you know, there's, there's a missing link in terms of making that connection. Because typically, if we're doing things in training that never occur in the way that we can process the game, that becomes a very difficult, I won't say sell, but a difficult um, translation for a player. And, and quite frankly, the easier we can make the game, uh, the better for everyone. You know, anybody can talk in terms um, to make things complicated sounding. I think the real magic lies in how can we simplify for players the link between I see, I have the technical ability to do. And so when I see if I've made the wrong decision, the players are going to know because it isn't going to work. But the more we can link the things we do in games and then propose them with options and have them make choices in practice. If we know that you know, breaking a puck out with pressure is something that we're looking to do. Players have choices, but there's that process that goes in terms of how we collect the information to make the right decisions and use the appropriate skills to solve the problem. So we know that learning requires repetition of correct behaviors in order to achieve unconscious competency. So Again, the, the key specifically at younger ages is creating scenarios where we're we're, we're pouring the foundation. And so, you know, without going too far into the idea of, well, I have an advanced novice team so we can push on, understood. But at every level of hockey, and there's a lot of people on this particular call and conference that have played a lot of hockey at very, very high levels, you're always going to play with players that are better than you, and you're always going to play with players that maybe aren't as, as accomplished as you. And often the difference between the ones that are, are more accomplished versus the ones that aren't is they don't think about things, they do things, and based on the experience that they, they, they've gone through coming up and developing as a player, they've taken that, that dial-up 
internet and it's turned into high speed by virtue of continual opportunity to repeat different behaviors and make decisions and figure out the ones that worked and the ones that didn't work. And I think, you know, when you talk to players, specifically ones that have played for a very long time, and they can introspectively look back on it and say, okay, you know, here's some of what I've gone through. The most powerful thing they'll tell you is, is you quickly figure out what doesn't work. And then when the light comes on, when you figure out the things that do, that didn't necessarily come from doing a drill. It came from doing a drill, messing a drill up, but then being exposed to options that gave you the choice to be able to say, all right, I've got another way here. This didn't work. I've tried it this way. What are some other ways? And they can introspectively look and say, okay, what skills have I got that allow me to execute this in such a way that I succeed versus I run into a roadblock? So hockey is a, it's really a game of recurring situations, although they all feel a little different, meaning, you know, the common recurring situations, the one-on-ones, the two-on-ones, the three-on-twos, as players are exposed to situations, they, they can become better at reacting to them if they're given the free thought to be able to understand what works and what doesn't. And so you can't memorize a one-on-one. But one thing that we know that we can do in a one-on-one or two-on-one, so whether it's a one-on-one on a puck that I've won out of the corner or it was a clean breakout and I'm coming down the wing, we know that those situations will happen on a fairly consistent and common recurring basis. And so with experience and the coach giving options, not, not dead set scenarios that you know, you're on a one-on-one and the way you beat someone is X. Well, there's different things and I'll call them triggers in a, in a training environment that we would look for as to this triggers me to represent, all right, here, here's the way that I'm going to succeed in this scenario based on the trigger that I've seen. So, for instance, I think we could all say we would recognize the trigger that if a defenseman crosses his feet in a one-on-one, they're susceptible to being cut back against the other way. So the idea of giving players options and allowing them to understand the things that are going to work in in varying scenarios is the sorts of feedback that coaches can provide without the black and white answer because we know while the, the, the scenario recurs, we also know that the same wrench won't always work on the same problem. Maybe we've got to do something to get that player to move their feet. And so in terms of how we create triggers, Some of those triggers might involve our skill level to get a player to do the things that they don't want to do if I'm an offensive player versus a defensive player and vice versa. All with the idea that we're looking for players to learn to react instinctively uh, as they're involved in these scenarios. So options available to players can be taught and practiced and experienced in games. And again, you know, a, a big, big believer in making sure the things that you do in practice lead to your ability to execute in a game and so um, if we're doing things in the name of skill that never really occur or really can't be traced back to any sort of functional use in a game it becomes difficult for those things to be productive when it comes to developing a player so it's essential to demonstrate and teach the options available to players so they have the ability to react to changing situations and again Really with the mindset that, you know, my reads have to lead to the the optimization of this skill is useful in this scenario and the history of me being able to do this because I've been in these scenarios and understood the options available to me and, and what's present. And I know based on experience that this is the option that's going to work for me. They're never in those scenarios and they've never had to make those reads. Um, you know, obviously it it becomes difficult to pick the right choice. So making sure these situations and different spots in the rink will help your players learn to adapt. But, you know, when you look at any of these scenarios, they can happen um, in the neutral zone. They can happen offensively entering the zone. They can happen off the rush. It can happen off the regroups. They can happen out of the corner. But really they're all the same concept in terms of if there's one versus one or two versus one or two versus two. It's about recognizing how do I create advantage for myself and or if I'm without the puck, how do I create advantage for teammate the puck carrier? 
So, you know, I, I've tried to, and, and this is, you know, what I started to research this and, and looked into how to make this the most simple that it could be. This really resonated with me in terms of four components um, of where you would apply intelligence or sense. And really, when you, you look at it from the perspective of the game is really played either with the puck or without it, either offensively or defensively. And I think that when you, when you think about that and you close your eyes and sort of break that down in your mind, if a player is not contributing in one of those areas, you're not really up to much. And so to put it further, um, you do not, you know, the four components of, of, and it's really two, offense and defense, and then with or without the puck, which split into four. Um, you know, they don't require you to have the puck, but a player with average puck still skill can find a way to impact the game and contribute to a team's success. Um, and offense of the puck is more than shooting or passing and making smart plays, or puck management is also a huge part of it. But when, when breaking it down, the, the more simple that we can make it A for ourselves. Uh, B for our colleagues, but most importantly for our players. Um, and, and, and we'll break down those four components. But from an offensive standpoint, you, you've got to learn to recognize ways to contribute when you have it, when you don't, and defensively when you have it and when you don't. And there's not much in between when you think about the game from that perspective in terms of your ability to, to contribute and make reads. And so... Here, we'll, we'll take a look at a clip, and this is the idea of offense with the puck. And so, pretty simple to see, and if we go back to it one more time, we'll go back to it one more time here. You know, we see really simple play. Latang pulls in, but he also shoots by a defender, and so, Offense at the puck. He has a puck, and, and player can pretty easily look at a clip like that and go, okay, well, he shot a puck and scored a goal. But he jumped into open space where there was a lane available for a puck, so made the read that move into space, don't stand still with my arms in the air looking for a one-timer, jump into a hole, and upon doing so, allow someone to skate in front, creating a screen, shooting past legs, and we've got an opportunity to create offense. Another example, so something that's a little less shooting based and a little more anybody that spent any time in and around me would, would recognize how much I'll talk about the concept of deception. Um, I really think that, that weight shifts, you know, weight shifts from hip to hip, head and shoulder fakes are really the basis um, for deception. And so here's an example of someone, I think this is Tyler Sagan. He's got the puck on his stick, weight shift, weight shift, patience. And so, you know, when we look at a clip like that, was he dangling or was he using skill to buy time and space to find an optimal opportunity? And again, you know, obviously these clips are, are serving to the point of what we're trying to look at. But if a player was to look at that, that would say, well, I, I need you know, technical skill to be able to possess the puck long enough to create offense in this particular scenario. So again, prime example of with the puck on my stick in clip one, we look at the idea of I can shoot that puck, you know, but allowing the mindset of jumping into a hole, allowing a screen to establish and shooting where a goalie can't see it. Clip two, you know, reference to the player, the idea that good strong skating posture, but not really stick handling the, the crap out of the puck as much as we're weight shifting, we're solving skill, we're using skill to solve problems, meaning I need to get this person out of my way to get into ice where I might be able to shoot a puck or score a goal, not trying to stick, 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 toe drag and beat someone with a puck out in front of me where it's easy to take it away from me. And so if, and I'll come back to that one one more time, you know, I, I think that the beauty in, in a play like that is how little handling there was. It was solve the problem that's in front of you, but not create more, not create an issue where there doesn't need to be one. 
Now, this is really one where now you can start to see from the thinking perspective, um, offense without the puck. And, and that's sort of a, when you say that, you can often feel weird saying an offense without the puck. It's really um, an opportunity to figure out how can I be of value to the person with the puck, number one. But number two, you know, we'll, we'll play it out here and see what you see. And so I'd like you to watch Kadri in this particular play. And so as it plays out, it's interesting. He kind of goes away from things and finds quiet ice um, to be able to jump back in a hole. And when you look back at a clip like that and, and as it approaches again here, so, you know, without getting too analytical on the play-by-play -play of it here, you know, we really got to, three on three with a little bit of back pressure in fact you can see the two blue jackets guys in the neutral zone coming back but but as we play here you know it's a missed net and then it breaks up and columbus is getting into their structure but if we watch Kadri comes into a soft spot rotates away and it almost looks like the game's not really moving all that fast for him and so when we look at a play like that what ways can we challenge our players to find that open ice by recognizing that everybody in the white jersey was mesmerized with the puck carrier. And oftentimes, you know, the way I like to relate talking to players, you know, how many coaches um, puck is, is on a player's stick from a defensive standpoint, how many coaches we want our toes facing the puck carrier, we want our eyes on the puck, we don't want to lose sight of the puck, but we want to have split vision. But yeah, but we, we definitely want to know where the puck's coming from. If we know that as a player without the puck, what things can we do in practice? What things can we do developmentally with a player that allows them to recognize if we know as a defensive posture the way that the, the sport is coached currently, how do we get lost uh, away from someone that's supposed to be covering me? Or if we know that everybody comes back to the house and we like to lock it up and crowd that area, how do we get into the soft areas? Well, number one, we want to recognize them. And number two, we want to recognize that if I'm standing still, I'm a pretty easy player to cover. Now, that doesn't mean heading off to left field and being so far away from the play that I'm not really open. I'm just out of the play. But what it is is recognizing that if people are fixated on puck carrier, it's an opportunity for me without the puck to find a scene, to find a place. And so for us to simplify that read, you know, I think is a real difference maker. Now, offense without the puck. And so here, again, another thing we're looking, and, you know, I'll play it back again for you. The puck carrier is the guy that, that found quiet ice away from the play. And, again, when you go back to this, and sorry, i got to go ahead to go back. Um, you know, we see that someone sprints away into open ice, and so everybody's fixated on where the puck is in the net front presence. It's 27 there that finds that quiet area and comes into a spot where we don't charge into covered areas. You know, and oftentimes players, you know, they want to impress their coach. I'm going to drive the net and I'm going to drive straight into a defenseman. And really, I, I'm not an option. How do I seek an opportunity to be in a spot where I can get the puck back, but I arrived because I was patient? And so oftentimes when, when we talk about as a sport playing fast and you know getting to spots and you know there's all this skating classes and all these things that we want to be fast 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 you know anybody that's played anybody that's coached has either played with coached or potentially even been someone that skated around and accomplished very little i was super fast it was all over the place but i didn't really accomplish much so it's about being fast at the right times. And so, you know, in our structure, why are we in such a hurry to get to spots? There's times to be fast, but here's an example of a time when maybe, you know, putting my head down and bearing down and getting to the net wouldn't have created opportunity, but buying a little bit of ice and finding open spots and, you know, without getting too technical, finding quiet area between the dots in the offensive zone is that's that's worth its weight in gold 
Now switching to the other side of the puck, defense on the puck. Um, so here's uh, an interesting one. And it, it just to give you an idea, I mean, this is probably the you know, defense on the puck here. We see we'll start it going back to the Sabres days here. Um, you know, we're trying in on a pin. We don't really get the pin done. And it's a dead play. Um, the defense at the puck. Well, was it good defense? Was it bad defense? I mean, we didn't stop momentum or movement of the puck, and it wound up being a shot on net. Um, but we saw at the start of the clip that we had hip position, body position. You know, we, we didn't really have stick on puck, and, and we didn't really set a pin. But in terms of immediate defense on the puck, that would have been an area we could have contributed. Um, here's a bad scenario at defense on the puck. So looking at, at a concept like this, player steps up to be physical. And we give up a three on one and it's it's a goal at the net. And so going back to that in terms of the read, you know, we're aggressive there. And, and there was a time when, you know, and that player's probably thinking, you know, I see a guy, it's maybe not in control, I'm gonna step up and be physical. And there's a hundred different reasons why a player might justify that as a play, but they weren't really reading the picture as a whole. So what that tells me is, you know, maybe it's a hockey sense issue. Um, maybe it's a fatigue issue. Maybe it's just a, a bad read and that I got tunnel vision and I didn't recognize that missing there created this scenario. So, you know, understanding what good and bad looks like is important. Again, defense off the puck. So here, you know, if we look at this screen right away, it sets up pretty good in the screen. It's a two on two plus one. The defensive team's doing all right here. Um, they got numbers, you know, as it starts. Uh-oh. So 50 decides that whether it's lack of focus, whether it's just got caught. And and uh, I guess that's a Norris Trophy winner standing in the slot. But we see it's interesting how something like that, when you slow it down and look at it, um, and if I go ahead and then I'll come back to it one more time. What started off as a favorable situation, a read created advantage. Now, I had talked earlier about the idea that the technical to the tactical 14 buys a little bit of ice because initially there wasn't a play there. And so there we see the concept that the read about a 14 on Colorado was that, hey, I don't have a play here, so I'm going to extend possession. And a play develops and you know recognizing a play developing after the fact and, and you see what you saw and so the, the point of these clips guys is that we're, we're trying to find scenarios in one of those four areas that allows it to be as simple to see what it might look like as possible again defense off of the puck here another similar scenario Just a, you know, and again, it'll play again. Someone comes up, charges into a hole, and and we have it. So I'm going to go back to that one again. You know, we see it here. It's it's not looking so bad until we get caught into a bad decision. And so recognizing you know, how might we break that down for a player would be what's the the risk assessment of charging into that hole? I jump in there and miss. You know, things like this, odd man's happen. So keeping the game in front of you is important. And so offensively, um, again, if I go back and then come back to this, you know, that's how quick it can happen. And we see that, you know, at that level, guys, they tend not to miss, right? I think, you know, when, when you look at from a sense perspective, one of the habits, and again, go a hundred different ways here in terms of coaching and teaching but um patrick sharp 10 that goal scored short side he looks off to 64 and freezes everybody just by that you know that that small portion of time that second um that, that flattens up the feet of the goaltender and by selling that pass it, it created it so from a habit perspective if he charged in bury his head and just try to shoot it you know, from a percentage standpoint, it's probably got less of an opportunity to succeed. So, um, you know, we're seeing some negative and, you know, 
implications of defense off the puck when we make um, decisions and run into holds and do different things that maybe aren't there in terms of the read. So getting into this, you know, one of the things and going right back to the structure of how do we, is there that magic pill? Is there that magic course? Fortunately, it's kind of like anything productive in life. There's no easy way. So, you you know, for a player to, to just be born with elite level hockey sense, I would argue that they probably do some things that people don't realize they do. I would imagine they watch more game film. And so anybody can watch game film. And anybody can watch game film and they can recognize recurring themes. And when we simplify and put the concepts in place that if, if you're contributing in one of those two areas, offensively or defensively, one, and two, um, with and without the puck, that's about as simple as I've been able to find in terms of making it digestible for players. And when you say that to yourself and when you think about that, that's a pretty simple way to look at the game, but ultimately, I think what we've seen, you know, right from the highest level to to just starting out, those things ring true. And so, you know, if players don't watch a ton of hockey, how can we solve that? Now, you know, not to age myself, but I think a lot of us, obviously on the call, probably spent a lot of time watching hockey as much as, as we might have done playing it. Um, and that's a challenge today. Kids are, are really motivated differently in terms of you know, are they sitting down watching a full game of hockey night in Canada? It's a lot of things that draw on their attention. So what can we do as coaches and player, you know, to, to bring our players along? Can we introduce them to the idea of game film, whether it's their own or NHL games? Um, you you got to put some in to get some out. And so there isn't that magic pill, unfortunately. So when they're watching game film, you know, and, and one of the things you can do, even as a young player, YouTube's a wonderful thing because you can get a player to say, you know, I'm coaching a, let's say you're coaching a novice team or a PB team or whatever the team is. You can, you can find last night's goals. You can find uh, the Ottawa Senators goals online from October or whatever month you're in or what have you. But instead of saying, go watch those goals, have them look for recurring situations, have them look for recurring patterns. Ask them to look for things in terms of how players are reading, reacting to this different situations with and without puck. And so, you know, interestingly, in a in a, a city like ours where you've got the Senators, you've got the 67s, you've got the Olympics across the border, you've got what, 12 junior A teams within an hour of the city, countless junior B. There's a lot of hockey to be able to watch and plus your own hockey. But instead of, you know, the big eat the whole plate of food concept, have them look for certain things. And what you'll find is what they, they take in from that experience um, in terms of looking for recurring situations or patterns uh, with and without the puck. You'll find that your players become a little bit more engaged rather than saying, we got to watch hockey or well, I want you to watch the whole Sens game tonight. Because it might not be realistic that they're able to, they're willing to, um, from from the the standpoint of time, from the standpoint of interest. You know, it might be tough to get a ten year old to sit down and watch a whole game of hockey. It's different than it was, and and you know the way we can teach it is also different than it was back when we may have sat and watched a full game of hockey night in Canada, whether it be as a fan or from a more discerning eye. So game feedback is one of the best methods of learning with each player. So as a part of Hockey Sense is how we provide feedback during games. Um, right and wrong is a really difficult way to, to lead. Um, and, and again, it always comes from a genuine place because typically as coaches, we want to make a difference for the positive. Um, but during games, can we provide observations while the game is in progress? What did you see out there? Great play. Did you see anything else? Player makes a mistake. They know they made a mistake. What did you see is some great insight into what the player was thinking. And so sometimes the player genuinely thought they had the play they didn't have. But sometimes they just made a mistake. They weren't trying to do what they did at all. 
Um, but what you can start to see in terms of that feedback is that relationship and that dialogue and that context um, allows players and coaches a to connect, but offer uh, you know offers a solution to situations to help players learn about options that maybe they just you know I, I don't want to piss the coach off, so I was trying to go to the guy on the wall, but you know maybe it's not within their purview to recognize the other team picked that up and they're coming down the wall on every play. So the gentle suggestion might be that, you know, let's look to the wall and find the middle or find out from them what they saw. Did you, you know, what did you see? Well, I saw that the wing was open. Did you see that the center was open? I didn't look. So one of the things that's important is that dialogue, but not creating that was right, that was wrong, as much as finding out what it is they see. And that will give you some of the keys that you need to figure out, is it a read thing? Um, is it a, a skill thing? You know, how many times is a player just not confident in the technical skill that they have to make the play that they saw? You know, maybe the play was I'm supposed to wheel the net and, and get going, but you know, like I, I just, I'm not feeling good in my skating right now, or I, you know, I feel good coming out the, the side of my forehand, but I, I really don't feel that great coming out to my backhand. Maybe it's not that they didn't see, it's that they didn't have confidence in the skill a technical skill that was required um, to create what it was that they were looking for. So, you know, obviously allowing players to make mistakes, essential part of the process. Now, you know, obviously in a competitive sport, and again, competitive meaning any sport you keep score in, mistakes, obviously we want to limit them. So, you know, our key is, is looking at frequency. If a player is, is you know, it, it's a defenseman, for instance, and it might be a retrieval, and and there's a high frequency of a player turning to their forehand and making the wrong play. Then let's look at, you know, the quality of the decision we make, and then follow it with: was there a deterrent being the read that I made, or was it confidence based in the skill that I needed in order to make the read that I made work? So it's it's making sure we recognize high frequency plays, and then. You know, how often is there success in the frequency of the plays that we make? And when we tie that all together, it's an easy opportunity to, to have the player look at alternative mindsets or alternative options for them during that setting. Having our players understand, you know, different options available to them in a variety of situations gives them opportunities to experience good starts, helping develop hockey sense. Um, you know, players are often a lot smarter than we give them credit for, but let's never underestimate they just Players want to succeed and they typically want to keep a coach happy. So part of you know us helping them succeed ultimately is helping them recognize, you know, don't be so fixated on something that you're not able to identify an alternative that might be of higher quality than what you might be doing with frequency. So a long-term process requires patience on the part of us as coaches. Um, unlike other countries where they're developing top-level players on purpose, you know, to a certain degree, and, and you know, we've relied on a little bit of luck, large numbers of players playing, and, and you know, this doesn't come from me as an opinion. This, this comes, you know, right at the Hockey Canada level. We talk a lot about how come smaller countries um, are, are putting out a lot of high quality players and at times it can feel as though maybe we've fallen behind well part of that is you know the, the the great part about that in terms of hockey in canada is that we're constantly evaluating ways that we can learn from from others learn ourselves in order to make players better and move the sport forward and so these sorts of things where understanding that the success of a player the roundedness of a player in terms of connecting skill to tactical processing uh, allows for more complete players and you know those things often stem from our ability to elicit feedback and give and take from players so practicing how you play um you know going back to the, the research you know from k anderson erickson you know, his work on, on practice forms on the basis of the 10,000 hour rule. I think a lot, co you know, a lot of us as coaches have, have read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, and the, the concept of 10,000 hours of practice, and you'll become an expert. Um, unfortunately, 
you know, there's some misinterpretation or potential for it in terms of the research, meaning, you know, 10,000 hours merely repeating the same activity is not necessarily the thing that's, you know, sufficient to catapult you. It's not like this magical number where if I do it, um, you know, I, I hit a baseball 10,000 times, I'm going to be really good at it. Deliberate practice involves stepping outside your comfort zone. And so oftentimes, um, when we talk about, you know, going back to some of those clips and when you look at it from a certain eye, you get caught up in sort of the, you know, if you think like a player as a younger player, maybe they get caught up in, in how come little Johnny can go in and shoot that puck and score that goal. Or you'd show that clip where, you know, someone jumps in a hole and gives up a two on one. Maybe the kid only sees, you know, Patrick Sharp going down and, and shooting. He only sees the goal because that's the only thing that was celebrated or the only thing that we glorified in terms of what was the accomplishment there. You know, deliberate practice involves stepping out of your comfort zone and, and trying activities beyond your current abilities. So, you know, in the beginning, it's sloppy and it's ugly and it doesn't look as, you know, and as coaches, we want it, we want it tight and organized and always looking right and fast and crisp and loud. And, you know, oftentimes with, with regard to deliberate practice in settings like this, where we're asking for thought process and tactic, um, it's going to look sloppy in the beginning, but that's because we've taken people out of their comfort zone and asked them to get uncomfortable with recognizing things that don't do and don't work. And so if you're continually doing things that you've mastered, it's, it's satisfying, but is it enough to get better? So if, you know, I always go down on a two on one and you know, I'm a big 12 year old and I, you know, I got a beard at 12 and I can just rip the puck. Is, is that the right play? I mean, I guess you could argue that if it goes in, maybe it is, but are we limiting the data set and the, the threat recognition and, and the play recognition of that player if they're not put into situations where they've got to find their options? Um, and moreover, simply wanting to improve isn't enough. People need a well-defined goal and, and the help of a teacher that makes a plan achievable for them. Um, and so it's really important that we recognize the deliberateness of practice but the sloppiness and the ugliness, if you will, that sometimes being out of our comfort zone can create. And so with that mindset, you know, just hammering away at something, especially a strength, um, is, is not necessarily going to be something that, that we want to hang our hat on, if that makes sense. So in conclusion, um, we want to understand a few things here. We need to understand how skill is important, but skill alone is not enough. Just being fast doesn't cut it. Just being skilled doesn't cut it. You know, you'll find plenty of players that can skate that hit a point where they just can't play anymore. You'll, you'll hit a, you'll find there's lots of players that have skill. Maybe they, they can't skate and they'll hit a level where they can't compensate one thing that carries players and you'll see it you know as as you you know the, the national hockey league is a really good um uh, example of players that as they get on in their career skating goes um you know but often reads in the mind doesn't go away and so for us skills have to provide the outlet for the reads and the intelligence to be applied. So it's very important as a foundation to have our fundamentals in place um, because those are things that give the confidence to accommodate the reads that we're going to encourage players to understand and make. Active coaching. So active coaching is not giving solutions, it's providing feedback and options and asking players to be active in how they recognize what's available to them. Offer reoccurring situation with options. So again, it's not this is what you do on a two on one. We want to enlist that back and forth and that feedback. We want to create situations where they understand what high percentage versus low percentage is. You know, two on two, bury my head, go really fast, get wide, don't cut, don't wait, rip a puck, hope. 
not necessarily what we're looking for. Making sure that they understand the options that maybe I've got to buy some time with the skills that we've created to allow a play to develop and the patience that goes with it. If you're the player without the puck, you're just as important as the player with the puck, you know, often understanding the answers that I have to ask myself and get the answers to how am I helping the puck carrier? Am I an outlet? Am I drawing space for him and in, in, in creating situations, but creating them and then having players live through the options. Allowing opportunity to make mistakes. At every level, obviously, we want to limit mistakes. We want to create situations where mistakes are mitigated, but that comes from the learning process. Keep practices as, as play-like as possible. Um, you know, without picking on any of the training that exists out there. Um, there's just so much that goes on that is really painted with a development brush or a skill brush that's a reach. Ask yourself, you know, is what I'm doing in terms of practice or training contribute to the way that I can play? If I'm constantly jumping things in practice, am I, you know, when's the last time you needed to jump something in a game? So ask yourself, does it mirror things that allow you to succeed in what it is that you're training for the game? Help players build skill goals. So again, you know, the more rounded a skill set that we can make, whether it's skating or puck skills or shooting or passing or whatever the, the, the core skill that we're looking for. Does it afford them time? Does it create pockets of time for them to allow their sense to pick up, take over? And so, you know, someone said to me, well, you know, I had presented, um, I had presented at a, uh, a conference and someone said, well, how do you, you take a 25-year-old you know, pro and you know, what do you do with him to help his hockey sense? Well, you're right. You know, you're starting late. If, you know, someone's 25 or 27 or 30 years old, they've played the game a certain way since the time they were four or five years old, what do you do? That's a great question. You know, the process remains the same, but maybe what you've got to start to at that point rely on is, all right, if I'm a really fast skater, can I use that skating or weaponize that skating or weaponize that puck skill to create pockets of time for myself? Because some players, you know, whatever point of their development have recognized within themselves it takes me i need this much time to make the read that generally becomes somewhat successful can i use the skills i possess to create more time so that i can process at the game speed that i currently run at and so that's an option where building skills goals is important extending possessions um, you know how I carry pucks with regard to solving a problem versus creating it, meaning, you know, am I in a spot where I can pass the puck, shoot the puck, or handle the puck at any time, or am I in a spot where I've got to bring it back to my hip and load it before I pass it? So things like that become, you know, they boil back to the habit standpoint that I talked about in earlier slides. It's important for us to recognize, you know, how skill contributes to the confidence that we need in order to make appropriate and then from a game feedback uh, standpoint, you know, I think anybody can be guilty of shoot that, you know, skate harder, back check, go to the net, shoot it. That's not game feedback. Game feedback for me is, is really making sure players understood their options by articulating what they may or may not have saw. And maybe we disagree with what they saw, but if they don't understand why that wasn't the proper read, us yelling shoot or skate or back check or whatever um, is nothing more than words and noise that create confusion for a player. Um, and so game feedback in terms of specifics and that give and take of recognizing it's as important that we know how they're thinking for us to influence some of the decisions they may make. So when we talk about players with IQ, you know, sort of getting towards the end here, what makes Sidney Crosby, Nick Backstrom, Wayne Gretzky. I mean, was there a, a player that exhibited better IQ? Pavel Datsuk are all considered to have high hockey IQ. When you look at all, you know, for instance, four of those players, 
they're all different in some way, shape, or form. Um, but one thing that they do is they're patient. They vary their speeds. They don't charge into places. They allow things to develop. But most importantly, all of it comes off of all of those players, off of creating time and space and letting things develop. So, you know, when we talk about those guys being in the right places in all three zones, possession or not, um, at a young age, what they did was they learned to seek open space. They, they learned that if I'm not being chased, you know, let things develop. And so when we talk about players that would show what IQ might appear as, what intelligence with and without the puck, offensively, those are some guys that would be great clips to show uh, for players to be able to relate to and, and to see. And for us, for teaching points, it gives us a good reference point of players to refer to. And those are just a few. Um, you know, there's many, many more. There's been thousands of players um, throughout time that, that are great examples of, of what we're talking about today. So from a big biography, resources, a lot of different things um, online. There's a lot of different resources, a lot of great follows. There's a lot more guys talking on Hockey Sense um, now um, than ever before. And the cool part about that is, um, from that perspective, don't be afraid to to look at the different things that are out there. Um, and this is is in an interesting topic because it's hard to quantify, right? It's it's you can't just go and find drills. Um, you got to work a little harder when it comes to how do I implement this or make this um, bite-sized pieces that a player can figure out what scenarios and reads look like and feel like um, and you know one of the things is is there's really no wrong when it comes to trying to find different material um, from a gameplay perspective um, that allows players to see what certain aspects look like and challenge them and have them talk to you um, you know, so I, I think what we'll do now, that, that's the end of the, the formal presentation. Let's open it up to, to Q&A um, and, and uh, certainly anything I can do to, to provide some different insight, I'd, I'd be happy to do. Oh, Brian, you're on mute. All right, awesome. Thanks so much, Pat. Um, okay, we've got your video. Uh, picture back in front of us. Um, we've we've had one question I'll share with you came in during your presentation across the chat wire. Okay. Uh, came in from Rob. Uh, he asked, what do you think about the USA Hockey IntelliGym software program? Their new uh, online cognitive learning system. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question, Rob. Great question. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of it. I, I know it's... Um, it doesn't, um, upon first review, it doesn't feel like hockey, if you will. You know, I think as hockey people, we all sort of look at it and go, um, you know, if it, it doesn't recognize, it doesn't, we don't recognize it as something we've seen. Um, is it useful? What I like about it is, you know, the give and go portions of it, the recognizing move to open space portions. I'm a big fan. The research really backs the um, the research really backs a lot of, of the scenarios and the, the learning outcomes that they're looking for when, with regard to that. Um, so absolutely, I, I am a big supporter of it. I really like the program. I've used it um, and I would encourage um, us, in fact, I've, I've recently done some stuff with it. I think as Hockey Canada people, we get a 15% discount on it. Um, not that I have any vested interest in it, but I just, as a person that's used it and paid money for it myself, um, and, and with kids that I've been involved with, um, now big supporter, and I think it, it's, it would be certainly worth uh, the time and the money. Excellent. Pat, would you see something like that, um, whether it's the IntelliGym or any other sort of online cognitive training type tool, do you see those more as supplemental 
or a complete training tool in and of itself. So I'm, I'm thinking about the hockey player who is not getting the learning they need from the practice and training environment. Does this build their hockey sense or, or do they need the training environment and this just helps supplement it? Um, I would say if in the absence of anything else, it would certainly be um, a main course. Um, I like to use it from a, a supplementary standpoint, for sure, um, because it's not necessarily, you're not going to see the recurring situations, but you will see the conceptual stuff where you've stepped in front of me, Jeff's got the puck, uh, I have to move to a spot where Jeff can give it back to me kind of concept. So I, I like it because it's, it's complementary in the sense that the theories or the executions are the same. It just it doesn't feel the same. It feels more like a video game, which in the respect of minor players um, makes it so that they're doing something productive without really even noticing that they're eating their vegetables, if you will. Cool. Okay. Um, we've got a question here from Luke Shabbat. Luke, I also see you on the video now. Do you want to just unmute your mic and ask your question to Pat? He's frozen. Maybe that's a no. Okay. I, I see Luke's question. How oh, much you? details okay. do you do during a game as in the player's thought process? Um, so in game on a bench, uh, you know, I'll often, I'll refer back to the idea, you know, typically when a player's coming out, I like to look at the game in terms of what happens with frequency. Um, what are players habitually doing in a high frequency fashion? You know, my questions would be to them, what did you see? What did you have? What did you not have? Um, where were you going there? And, 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 you know, I'll get into those dialogues and, and I won't, I'll ask them for, you know, different mindsets that they're seeing. I saw this or I didn't see that or I thought this. And then offer them suggestions in terms of, you know, maybe this is a better choice or maybe this is something you can try that might work a little bit better for you next time. Um, because what, we want is for them to figure it out. We want to mitigate mistakes and risk, but we need them specifically from a developmental standpoint to figure it out. And so we're not always going to be there in a training session. I can stand there and bark the answers at you and get you to go through the session and it looks great. And, and I feel really accomplished, but if you didn't solve problems based on reads you made, so the challenge always becomes giving them information that maybe is higher percentage of what they did, but asking them to try to identify how do they use it when they use it. Cool. I haven't, I don't see any other questions on the chat line. Um, oh. Just had another one come in. Pat, do you see that one? Uh, not yet, no. Okay. Uh, came in from uh, Camille Lebrun. To what degree do you believe the physiological state of a player has an effect on their ability to effectively and properly use their decision-making process? So from a growth perspective, from an age and maturity perspective, they're going to make decisions at the level that they're at in terms of maturity, in terms of physiological growth, in terms of mental capacity, um, interest level, stress. There's a lot of things that play into that. Um, the information in terms of the way that they would look at something, the process by which they create decisions, you know, form risk assessments, et cetera, et cetera, are going to be processed at, at you know, assuming a young, healthy athlete, you know, they're going to process that information based on the capacity of their physiological age and maturity. Um, it's, it's up to us to make sure the process that we help them develop is appropriate, is in that they can understand. Again, I, I'm hoping that I simplified, you know, in today's presentation. I mean, any of us can put words to it and make it more difficult. I think the real challenge is, can I help a 10-year-old process the way a 10-year-old can? Um, and that starts with the way we 
help them process information without making it in you know, water that's too deep for them to swim in, for instance, if, if that makes sense. Hopefully mm -hmm. that answers your question. Yeah. One of the examples that she presented in her question um, from a physiological perspective gets into things like uh, complex motor skills starts to fall off typically after, you know, a heart rate of 145. Auditory exclusions will start to kick out at about 175. So as players get, you know, in simple terms, as a player gets more and more exhausted, mm -hmm. they start to hit these thresholds of things falling by the wayside. That, you know, we would all assume that that would start to impact their decision making as well at some point. We often hear, you know, the more tired the brain gets, you know. Um, so from that perspective, for me, you know, um, you know, as lactate, for instance, builds in, in an athlete, not only does it seize up their muscles, their decision making. I think we, we know that research shows us their decision making is affected as we fatigue physiologically, especially anaerobically. Um, it, it starts to impact the way that we think. And so going back to decision making process, you know, creating triggers you know, for our players to, to recognize this is how I'm going to extend my possession to buy time in order to process at the time that I need in order to make a quality decision. You know, for us, you know, determining what the quality is and helping players understand what the quality is is a key, but really creating that pathway of what are the triggers that allow me um, to make a decision and, and what those triggers look like. I'm being pressured. I'm not being pressured. You know, I start to lose my skill level and my decision making ability as I get tired. But with that said, what triggers, you know, have I started to institute in the way that I think the game um, that a coach has helped me develop that allow me to make the best decision I can with the information given to me from the play? Yeah. We don't have any other questions on the chat um jr was there any other information you wanted to share with those that are still on the call um with um, regards to next week uh what you'll do to send out links and etc yeah um like it was been posted everyone who's dev one or hp1 certified will receive three points for each one of these that they attend live so i'll get that up either tonight or tomorrow so you'll receive uh three points for that um our link for next week it's Jason Clark, I believe, uh, will be presenting next week. Uh, the link should be out sometime tomorrow morning. I would recommend registering early if you can. Last week we sold out in eight hours. Our, our limit was at eight in eight hours. So um, once you see that, if you are interested, like again, like I said, again, it'll be worth three points next week as well. And uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Yeah. JR. Yeah, I, uh, for, for, for everybody, I mean, these, uh, we've got a lot of talented people in the branch. Um, you know, Jason speaking that, you know, next week, uh, last week, um, you know, it, it went over fantastic. Use these resources. I, um, you know, Jason is a, is a rock star when it, when it comes to the things he's speaking on. Um, Roby and Brian, this is, these are great initiatives. Um, we've got a ton, an absolute ton of talent in this branch and so much to share. So this is such a cool experience, um, I think, for people to, to take advantage of. Um, you know, even past this pandemic, this this might be something, I think, based on how these are going, um, could certainly be something that, that, you know, helps people get this information um, without having to take a night of their time and, and leave the home. So, Brian, uh, Roby, thanks. This has been great. Guys, you know, take every advantage of this. I know these types of things are going on all around the world, but I would certainly put the, the list of people we've got in the branch here against anyone around the world and the stuff that we're doing. Um, you know, this, this is great. So thanks to everybody for, for, for coming into this tonight. Uh, I know I'll be logged in and, and, and checking out the future ones. Um, you know, I'm excited to see those and, and you know, as much a student as, as everybody else. So uh, thanks again, guys. Thank you, Pat. Thanks a lot, Pat. JR, just before coaches start to sign off, uh, the three uh, certification maintenance points, will they be required to respond to an email that you are sending out? Uh, nope, all good. Yep, everything's good? Okay. Yep. Excellent. Okay, uh, thanks everybody. Um, hats off to all those who 
gave up a beautiful summer's evening, our first beautiful summer's evening of, of the, the, the year. Um, hope to see you all next week. Jason's topic is on uh, his top 15 habits for elite players. It should be very interesting. Uh, next Wednesday, 7 o'clock, uh, same bat time, same bat channel, so to speak. Um, so with that, thank you very much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your week. We'll see you all next week.